Hello everyone, today is Thursday, June 6, 2019, and this is the week in charts. I obviously want to thank all of you guys and gals for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be here, and I'm humbled by your presence. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions, I don't have a lot more to say about that. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep your questions to what's on the slides and towards the end when we, into the slides that is, when I flip out to the charts, feel free to ask questions about anything. If it requires a lot of thought, as some of you here know who are members of DaveLeonard.com, I will put together a well thought out presentation and present it in the next Q&A. If you don't have access to q and I'll give you access for that one week. All right, so what do we talk about? Well, obviously, I want to continue to talk about charts in a chart show, and that's a concept, focusing a lot on the indices, and then we get to the live charts, spend some time on some of the sector action and what's going on. I guess the question is, where's winter? So winter is coming. Where is it? And that'll make a lot more sense. I want to continue my discussion of the TFM 10% system. I never dreamed I'd have so many questions on this, and it would create so much, I guess, excitement, for lack of a better word. So I'm actually personally pretty excited about that. I want to talk a little bit about trading ogres and my favorite ones to trade that's opening gap reversals. And it's been a while since we talked about psychology, and it's something that I want to touch upon based on something that happened earlier in the week. And then based on that, too, I want to talk a little bit about hands-off trading. So we've got a lot to talk about. Now, I'm going to rush through this TFM 10% system because we've been talking about it probably for the last four or five weeks or longer in the week in charts. Let me just give you the rules real quick. Take a snapshot of your screen if you want. Or... I think I put it up on Facebook in the general section, not the uh, the member section. But that's the rules. Pretty simple. You basically want to be long as long as the market is within 10% of its 50-week closing high, and the last couple of weeks are greater than the moving average. In other words, you have two weeks of Landry light, and you want to exit when you're 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high and the close is below the 50-week moving average. And that'll make a lot more sense. But I'm going to rush through this quickly because there's a few things I want to get to on this. I want to basically focus on giving you an update on where are we now. But here's a sell signal. Notice that coming into the sell signal, the market was trending nicely higher. Believe it or not, I think this is the S&P 500 going back to the 20s. Yeah, 1929. And you can see we have plenty of Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average. And that's a 50-week moving average. And this little ribbon I programmed in here basically stays bullish as long as you are within 10% of a 50-week closing high and you have Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average. Now, as soon as you go more than 10% away from the 50-week closing high, in other words, you drop 10%, then this ribbon turns to neutral, and then once you cross below the 50-week moving average, this ribbon will then turn to bearish. So this is what it looks like. I think this is the last signal. Yeah, this was the last sell signal. Notice that we went to right at about 10% below the 50-week closing high, and then we also closed below the 50-week moving average. So that was your sell signal there. And notice the ribbon turned bearish. It turned neutral for a little while because we came right back above the 50-week moving average. And then once we went back below it, it turned bearish again. Here's the last buy signal. Notice that we were more than 10% away from the 50-week closing high. And then we came within 10% of that 50-week closing high. So that plus the daylight or Landry light, as I now call it, of two bars or two weeks above the 50 week moving average, that was our last buy signal. So I wanted to update the spreadsheet and based on the questions that I've received over the week and the conversation that we had yesterday, 
in the Q&A, which I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, I wanted to go ahead and update the spreadsheet. So we can see the last signal, which put us long again. We're only up 1%. Now, if you go back in and look at last, I think it was two weeks ago in the presentation, initially I was a little concerned because it was only up 2%. And the market had ran like 25% from the lows. But what you have to remember is the market is actually still down because buy and hold held through that entire slide. And until, until and unless the market makes new highs, then being out of the market would be the good thing based on this particular system. Now, when I set out to design a system, and usually I don't just sit here and say, oh, I'm going to design a system today. It's just something inspires me to do it and usually it's you guys and like I was talking about yesterday in the Q&A that's one reason that I continue this educational business is because you make me want to be better and if I get better you get better you get better I get better and it becomes very cyclical but anyway you inspire me to do things like this and for instance the little five-day simple moving average IPO set up which is i just released without even putting behind a firewall or anything it was free and basically i came up with that as a simple way to stay out of crappy ipos and you inspired me to come up with something like that so it's it's in some ways it's selfish and self-serving but then it's also cyclical my research can help you you're you're taking my research and running with it and running with the ball can help me improve that research even further but anyway, when I do get inspired to fire up the computers and start programming and looking at a lot of charts and hand testing things and et cetera, my ultimate goal obviously would be to beat buy and hold. But I'm also more concerned about avoiding diaper change moments. And I think that's that's even more important. Because every now and then, as you know, the market will give you a 50% or more haircut. And I've seen two of those in my lifetime. And I'm old, but I'm not that old, right? So very important, for instance, in 2000 and in 2008 to get out of the way. And I don't want to go on and on too much about this. But obviously, if you're nearing retirement and you lose half your money, right before it's time to retire, you might have to continue working. And it's very important, even if even if you're, let's say you're not near retirement or whatever, but something happens, God forbid, where you might need that money back sooner rather than later. Believe me, I've learned over the last couple of years that life comes at you really fast. Remember there was those commercials, those insurance commercials, life comes at you fast. There was a What's his name? Fabio. You know, he's all studly and all, and he goes under the tunnel and he comes out like an old man. Anyway, life does come at you really fast. So even if the market does come back, I mean, it only took eight years in one case, and I guess another 10 years in the other, maybe a little bit less. It doesn't always come back, and there's no guarantees, obviously. And here's the other thing, too, and this is one thing that I talked about a little bit last time, is that... Even the last sell signal, the market did drop another 11% after you were out of the market. And like I said last time, 11%, let's say you've got a half a million saved for retirement. You just lost 50-something thousand dollars over a very short period of time. And believe me, psychologically, that does have an impact. And I know this for sure or for a fact because I start getting phone calls when this begins to happen. I don't know why friends and relatives don't bother reading me or listening to webinars or just flat out asking me ahead of time, but it seems like I only hear from them when things get really, 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 really dicey. Now, based on yesterday's close, 6-5-2019, it was only up 1% on that last trade and you've been in for 96 days. Now, last week, we were closing in on a possible sell signal. You can see there's the 10%. If you look at the top, if you look up here, you can see 10% line is right here, meaning that this, based on this close, if you take that measurement, we were at 
6.58% last week. So we weren't that far away from being more than 10% away from the closing high. Now, as of last night or yesterday's close, we were only 4% away from that closing high. And also notice that we are back above the 50 week moving average. Now, keep in mind that just an FYI, and I don't think it makes that big of a difference, but you'll notice that based on this chart, it shows its close above the 50 week moving average and the Metastock chart showed it actually below the moving average. I think it's because a Telechart uses a rolling average and it's possible that Metastock uses a calendar one. But either way, I think that by the time you get 10% away from that closing high, the chances of it getting below that 50 day moving average in both charting packages are pretty good. But I'm just kind of seeing this on the fly. That might be something that we might want to flesh out a little bit further. So as you can see, that slide is now down to right at about 4% or improving from 6.58% to only 4%. So, so far we don't have a sell signal and so far the system does remain long. Now, in yesterday's Q&A, we talked a lot about market timing and longer term beating, buying, hold. And we this is why I'm continuing the conversation. One of the reasons that I'm continuing the conversation conversations on the system. And the question, without going into a lot of details, you can watch yesterday's Q&A for more on that, but basically was for me to flesh out, like, why do I have this system? Why did I create it? Do you buy stocks when, when it's a buy signal? Do you use it on individual stocks? And on and on. So first and foremost, it's just another tool, and it's kind of a puzzle piece, if you will, but I do think it could be the start of something bigger. And this is where I'm coming from. If you look at the Facebook group, Jim was talking about this market timing and his views on market timing. And then I had a very long winded answer to that, which led to the Q and A and fleshing all this stuff out further. And this is kind of where we are now. So there's still a lot more to do on this, even with some, even amazingly with something so simple. The bottom line is if you're under a buy with this or any other type of system for that matter, using it as again, part one of your pieces of the puzzle. And by the way, if you were a trend follower, then stick with trend following. I think if you use too many systems, you'll end up with an analysis paralysis, especially if you one of your systems is like reversion to the mean, and then you got trend following because trend following, even when the market is super duper oversold is gonna say, well, you're in sell mode or you're in down mode, whereas reversion to the mean might actually give you a buy signal. So I like to stick with trend following and trend following alone with a few small caveats, maybe a day trade here and there from overbought or oversold, which we'll talk a little bit about in one second. But when you're using these systems, just use it as another tool. It's like, okay, we're following these trend following systems, which I'll show you a couple in just one second. The TFM is a is still a buy, but could turn negative soon. The bow ties are negative, the daylight is negative, and so on and so forth. It just kind of add it all up as one piece of the puzzle. And as long, again, as you're just focused on one core methodology, such as trend following, you're not going to get a whole lot of analysis paralysis. You might have three out of four sell signals or two out of four sell signals, one neutral, and one on the cusp. Now, if you're under a sell, meaning that system has you short, or in the case of TFM, we don't actually put on shorts because it's it's not designed to be a long short type of system. But if you're under a sell signal, then you want to be very selective on the long side. Now, being selective is a couple of things. One, you only want to take the mother of all setups, something that you just think is fantastic. Two, ideally, it should be something that could trade contrary to the market, such as a more volatile stock, such as something like an IPO. That's not going to be held as hostage to the overall market as, let's say, a big cap stock, which is probably a big part of an index. 
which will likely have a very, very low beta. In other words, it will trade in tandem for the most part with the overall market, whereas the high beta stocks are going to trade more independently. Commodity-related stocks, easy for me to say, sometimes can trade independently of the overall market. And then also consider shorting if you're starting to see this and other signals trigger. Now, keep in mind the designer's intent is very important when you're looking at a system. Reader's Digest version, I was helping someone pick stocks years and years ago, and I also was doing a little ghostwriting about setups and stuff like that. And long story endless, when I was in a training phase, I would show him a setup and say, here's one of your setups. And he would say, no, it's not. And we would go back and forth. I would show him mechanically that it was. I followed the rules. I ran my programs. I ran the software, blah, blah, blah. I wrote the software. Anyway, long story endless, he'd say, well, I don't like it. So I quickly learned that there's a lot more to trading than push a button and get a peanut. Now, keep in mind that the 10% number is based on the general overall market volatility basis, the S&P. Not that I want to listen to what the media says, but as a general statement, the media considers a bear market a 20% or more drop from the highs. And I think that's a pretty good number. So I think that 10% is probably a good part, a good uh, time to consider getting out of the market. Now, usually a market will drop about 10% before dropping a lot more. And it does give you time to get out of the way. If that number were much bigger, it's possible that you could be entering into a crash mode. Not that a crash can't happen before market goes down 10%. In other words, market could possibly drop 5% and then gap down another 15% overnight. It could happen, I suppose. But so far... It hasn't happened so far after new highs the market tends to consolidate and that crash doesn't come after the day after a new high so far at least maybe so far being the keywords in that sentence now keep in mind 10% is a good round number for the overall market basis the S&P for other markets if you were experimenting and I'd encourage you to take any research that I do and and take the ball and run with it you know that's fine that's great but it could be higher or lower depending on the market's volatility. And it could be so crazy in something like an IPO where, I mean, uh, or an IPO, I meant to say a biotech, but also an IPO where it could be something like 30% or something. And it just, it might not even be meaningful. By the way, overall or longer term, I should say, as a general statement, markets, the indices that is, they really don't trend that well. And you're like, but Dave, look at the big blue arrow. Well. Long, long term, they can trend, but there's a lot of zigs and zags along the way. So a system designed to trend follow the overall market might not work as well in more inefficient type of market. So an overall market's quite efficient and tends to be more choppy, as I said in yesterday's Q&A, back in my CTA days when I used to spend hours and hours and hours programming computers trying to figure out my trend following approach to commodities, I could never make the S&P 500 work over the short to somewhat intermediate term, and that's because the indices don't really trend that well. But if you take a long, long-term approach and look at like a weekly chart and use something like the TFM 10% or weekly bow ties and things like that, which we'll talk about in just one second, it can work quite nicely. And I guess the flip side of that is if you do get a short-term trend signal, then just keep in mind that it's going to be very hard for that longer-term trend to sustain because markets tend to be a little choppy. Now, one of the indicators by complete accident that came out of this was just plotting uh, an indicator that was 90% of the closing high for a parameter of 50 days. So this is just a visual representation of what this is showing up here, okay? So right here, and let me maybe get my pen plugged in. Anybody ever plug in a USB the right way the first time? <laughs> what a pain. 
I don't know why they made them like that. Never works out. It really doesn't. They should, they should have like a little notch, this end up or something. So what I did here was, again, if, I don't know if you could read this on your screen, but I programmed a little indicator. It basically, I want to be 90% of the 50 week HHV, highest high value of the close. Okay, so... 90% of the highest high value of the close, not the high, okay, for 50 weeks. And that's what this is here. And you can see that when it dips below this number, and here just the lows look like got below it, but you can see it begins approaching that 10% line. So here we're above it. Notice that we're above 10%, I should say. This is 10%, okay. So we're more than 10% away from that closing high. So this would look back 50 days, probably looking back to about right there. That's where your 10% line is. And then you can see we begin to probe it back in 2016. And then obviously we touched it recently. I don't think we closed below it back in 2018. However, in 2019, we did obviously dip below it. Notice that we spiked up here. And that was a pretty serious market slide that we saw. So just another little tool to help to keep you on the right side of the market. Again, you don't want to plot an oscillator and all kinds of other indicators of the market that could end up contra to, the, to each other. But if you're plotting something like this, you're plotting something like a 50-week moving average that looks something like this, and maybe some bow ties like we'll look at in just one second where they all tend to operate in the same way. Maybe one's a little quicker than the other, or maybe one has a little bit more lag than the other, depending on how you want to look at it. Then I think it's okay to look at several of these type of trend following systems. Also, one thing that I didn't get around to doing before I went live is to put some net net price charts in, but basically with net net, all you're doing is saying, okay, where's the market now? 2026, where was the market about a year ago? 2826. So if you didn't know anything, you'd say, well, geez, we really haven't trended much in about a year. So there you have it. Even though it's like, look at the market, it goes up all the time. No, it doesn't. Okay. It went a whole year without going anywhere. So that's not a trending market. Yeah, you had some big zigs and zags, but obviously it hasn't gone anywhere in a while. In the shorter term, the net net is we've had a pretty serious slide in here, okay? And we'll take a look at that in just one second. So that's just that little indicator based on 10% away from closing high. It's kind of fun. I've kind of noodled with it a little bit on individual stocks and on intraday charts and all. And it is kind of fun, and it sort of serves as another reminder to me when I'm long a stock especially if I'm doing like an opening gap reversal and an index or something, I've got that plotted on a chart. It reminds me to make sure I'm on the right side of the market for the time frame that I'm trading. All right, so if we take a longer term approach or more specifically, if we back this chart way out, this little 10% line, whatever you wanna call it, as you can see is just, again, it's another tool and I guess the question is, how many tools do we need to stay on the right side of the market? It's like, well, as long as they're similar in nature, I think it's okay to have as many as you want. But you can see here, again, we went above 10%, okay, meaning that, or this indicator went above 10%, meaning that, and, you know, I'm just thinking here, maybe I should flip this upside down so it would be a little bit more intuitive, but right here, the market did drop below 10%. Now I'm gonna show you some of my favorite signals here, such as bow ties in one second, but just using this simple little system here, what happened in 2000? Well, you were getting a sell signal here. What happened in 2007, early 2008? You were getting a sell signal here. And I'm gonna show you how other systems showed similar things. And by the way, if you have a V-shaped recovery like this, the entry point does not catch up to price because you're still working off the same highs. But when you have a longer term bear market like this, it goes down and down and down. It takes two years to consolidate. 
you could see that the indicator will catch up the price. So there is some lag in this and like everything else. And by the way, you do actually, believe it or not, when you are longer term trend following in something like an index where it's not really prone to trend, at least not over the short or intermediate term, you do want something, or I guess, let me rephrase that. Instead of saying not prone to trend, prone to being choppy, okay? It might trend, but it might be all over the place in the progress process. So let's look at from here to here. Well, that's an amazing trend, but boy, there was some huge zigs and zags along the way that would have knocked you out. So hopefully I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth, but indices can be really choppy. Just know that. Now let's just get back quickly to some other simplified market timing. I talk a lot about weekly bow ties, which I'll show you here in just one second. And then I happen to notice that just using a weekly 50 week or a weekly chart with a 50 week moving average and the concept of Landry light, meaning that the highs are less than the moving average for the downside and greater than the moving average for the upside would also do a fairly fantastic job of keeping you on the right side of the market. So this green in here, as long as it's green, you are above or the lows are above the moving average. As long as it's red, the highs are below the moving average. So it's kind of like a red light, green light type of system. And it doesn't mean that you should exit every time it flips, but you might want to get a little cautious when that occurs, especially if the amount of daylight begins to build. In other words, the number of days of daylight. And again, as I said, ad nauseum, this is just, this is not the magnitude this is not a measurement of how far away you are from that moving average. It's just how many days you have been above that moving average. And one of the things that I've noticed by complete accident after programming this little area chart, and actually I think Metastock programmed this for me, and I just kind of noodled with it a little bit. So uh, correction on that. But uh, if you do get Metastock, if you have buy the latest version, my indicators are already in there, so just a little FYI on that. I don't get anything for those, okay, other than uh, recognition. But the point is, by playing with this little indicator that I asked in the program for me, I noticed that when you approach 100, the market tends to be in corrective mode, or it's sort of like you're counting the days until the market corrects. Not that you want to time the market on that, but if you are in profit-taking mode, you say, well, you know, this thing is getting a little frothy in here. It probably wouldn't hurt to take a little bit off the table. So that's just one of the observations that I've seen. And that's not market timing in and of itself. That's just kind of common sense, like, okay, we've gone a long, long ways without a correction. So maybe I need to be kind of careful in here. And that doesn't mean, again, you sell a form, but you might think, you know what, let me make sure – that this next long I put on, because I already have 10 long positions, let me make sure that I really, really, really like it. And in this position here, that's really close to the profit target. Maybe I need to think about taking those profits just a tiny bit early, just to pull a little bit of money off the table. Now, I've kind of beat the dead horse on the major bow ties on a weekly chart, but it's something kind of cool to a point where somebody said, can you stop talking about that? And I guess somebody's going to probably say that about the TFM 10% system too. But a major bow tie is when you have a weekly crossing of the 10 simple, 20 exponential, and 30 exponential after all-time highs or major, major lows for buys. And it's obviously, if we go to all-time lows in SP 500, you know, trading the market is going to be the last of your problems. Anyway, before I digress too far, you can see that we were in uptrend proper order, meaning the 10 was above the 20, was above the 30, and then they flipped over to downtrend proper order right as the new year began. And I just think that's really, really cool. Like the last day of the, possibly even the last day of 2007, you were in downtrend proper order or close to it within the first week of trading. And then your signal, your sell signal was right in here. You had a little bit of a retrace higher, but we all know what happened next. Now, 
when the market's down 30, 40 percent, that's when the diaper change moment starts happening. That's when my phone starts ringing. Okay. And by the way, that might actually be a good timing signal. It's like when people start calling me freaking out about the market, it's probably time to start looking for a low. <laughs> but the point is, these simple, and it never ceases to amaze me, but these simple trend following techniques and simple little systems, not that I have anything that's amazing, you know, or, or a gee whiz, but these simple little systems, and by the way, if you're going to trade a system, you're much better off trading a simple system, but that's another conversation. But it, it never ceases to amaze me that something so simple could actually keep you out of so much trouble. And I think that's the whole point. So if we take a look at the major sell signal, obviously we have 2000 and 2008, and then we had another major sell signal in 2015. Now that one didn't turn into the mother of all sell-offs, but the market did drop substantially from that. And I think if memory serves, don't hold me to it, but somewhere around there was like an 18% drop in the Russell 2000 after that. So it's significant enough. And then believe it or not, we did have a crossing and a setup last year, but that one didn't actually trigger. And the buys were the 2002, 2003, my arrow might be a little off. It might need to actually go to the left a little bit, but that one was really beautiful in textbook. The one in 2009 was a little late to the game, but that's typical of a moving average type of system. And the daily obviously triggered much sooner. Speaking of fractal patterns, it, this kind of leads us into our next discussion here. And this is one thing we were talking a little bit about in the Facebook group. If you take a look at something like the spiders or any other index coming off of all-time highs and pay attention to hourly bow ties, an hourly bow tie is not going to always signify the all-time high of the market to be the all-time top. But a lot of times a major turn will happen and that hourly bow tie will let you know ahead of time. Now, obviously, the more you drill down, the further you drill down, the more the chances that you're going to get more and more false signals. But it does pay to pay attention. And Jim, who's, I don't know if he's in here today, but he's in the Facebook group. And that's one of the things he was talking about is that that's kind of like his heads up, put a little antenna up like, oh, wait a minute, the hourly bow tie has changed in this index. Maybe I need to get ready to get ready. I don't want to rush out and try to do longer term trend following off an hourly chart, which would be a, probably a bad idea. But maybe I want to pay, maybe it pays to pay attention. So it's probably not a bad thing. The other thing that I do is in something like Forex, I will look to, to catch major trend changes off the hourly chart. And 99 out of 100 times, I don't catch a major trend change. Sometimes I'll get a little swing trade out and get stopped out on the rest. And that's, well, if I could do that every time, I don't, I'd eventually own the world because I eventually catch a big trend. But more often than not, I get knocked out of the position either out of scratch or a fairly so small loss. And as I've said before, read the last now column on my website, which is for the 531.19, I believe. And you'll see where I talked a lot about how it really feels like beating your head against the wall with that type of trading because more often than not, you're going to be wrong trying to capture that trend change in such an efficient market, such as Forex. But when it works, you make a lot of money compared to what you put out. So it does eventually pay off. Hey, Jim. Yeah, Jim, you were talking about the hourly changes, and I hope I, um, I hope I quoted you right on that. I think that's what you were doing. So the question is, is winter still coming? And we all know that bastard Jon Snow for – was it eight seasons or seven seasons? Talked about winter is coming, and finally, I think winter actually came. <laughs> this market has been more disappointing than the last episode of Game of Thrones. Anyway, I just want to show you one chart here, and we'll go to live charts here in a few minutes. But this is what I've been talking about forever, and ad nauseum, is the fact that the Russell 2000 has made this big picture retrace rally stalling well short of its prior highs. And so far, it has sold off out of that retrace rally. So that's a little concerning. If it pops back up to 160 basis, the IWM, 
and then maybe we're okay. But anything below that, I would remain skeptical and cautious. Now, I will occasionally trade an opening gap reversal as a reversion to the mean type of trade. And keep in mind, it's just that's a day trade type of thing. But my favorite ones occur, and I'll map out this trade maybe in the next now column or maybe the next, definitely the next Q&A. But you can see the SOXX, which is three times inverted direction semiconductor. I would not encourage you to, to trade this longer term and hold this longer term because all of these short ETFs will eventually go to zero. But over a very short time, especially like a day trade, they can be worthwhile. And so it pulled back kind of nicely in here. And then we had a nice little gap lower yesterday, which turned out to be a decent little day trade for an open gap reversal, better than a poke in the eye. And again, I'll walk you through that specific trade soon. I'll show you another opening gap trade here in just one second, which actually is going to be very similar, at least from a money manager standpoint, on how I played it. So my favorite opening gap reversals are those that dovetail in with the core methodology. What's the core methodology say? Well, we're looking to catch a, a pullback, or, or I should say a trend resumption out of a pullback, or a trend transition out of a bow tie, or a first thrust, and we had all those things working here. So I would much rather trade an opening gap reversal in the direction of the trend, and keep in mind that this is just a little day trade we're firing off, but I'd much rather do that as opposed to against the trend. Now, the market implodes for a while, and it just looks absolutely abysmal. The fear is so thick, you can cut it with a knife. You come in, the future is getting whacked over overnight, just absolutely creamed. You're down at these multi-month lows or multi-year lows, and then all of a sudden you see some buying begin to come in. Your risk is down to that new low, which is very close and your potential war reward would be the mother of all trend day. So that makes it worthwhile. But it's hard to sit on your hands and wait until that comes along. And, and I'll probably have to talk, or well, probably will talk, I should say, a lot more about patience in upcoming presentations. Because that's probably one thing I talk about more than anything is patience. And I'll probably spend a lot more time on that really soon. Now, I haven't completely forgotten about trading psychology. And I have some research that I'm doing here but it's kind of on a back burner a little bit lately, but I, I miss it and I'm, I'm ready to get back into it. And in the meantime, I've been very cognizant of my own psychology. And of course, I'm writing down my F-bombs and all that in my trader's journal daily. And I've got my little shame <laughs> notes for when I'm doing something that I shouldn't. On Monday, I was a guest, I wasn't the host, but I was a guest of the Crowd Forecast News show, which you can watch on YouTube. And Jake Bernstein was on, and he was quoting Larry Williams. He didn't say who he was quoting at the time, but I emailed him afterwards, and he told me it was Larry Williams. So I want to give both Jake credit for bringing this to my attention, and also Larry Williams for coming up with the quote in the first place. To make money as a trader, you have to not care. As soon as you start caring, you have emotional attachment. It's counterintuitive. The more you care, the less you make. The more you're clinically dispassionate and less attached to your trades, the more you will make. It's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. Now, that is a mouthful. And after Jake had said that quote, I began thinking, this reminds me of so many things I talk about in trading psychology and so many things that I want to cover in trading psychology. So I'm just going to scratch the surface today and just bring up a couple things. One thing that Jake talked about, which I often talk about too, is sometimes going into the trade, and I know it's easier said than done, and I believe me, I, I fight with my own psychological demons quite a bit. But you have to take, so to speak, that loss going in. As soon as you put on a trade, you need to tell yourself, I can lose this amount of money if I'm stopped out. And it could be a little bit worse if the market gets away from me. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking mostly about, well, I'm risking 
two percent, say you got a hundred K, it's two thousand dollars. So I'm risking two thousand dollars. You have to almost think like that's what this trade's going to cost me. As I've said before, you could view the trade going in as a cost. And then anything else, anything less than that total cost, I make a little air quotes, would be, as we say in the South, in Louisiana, at least lanyap would be good. You improve upon that potential loss. Now, I would encourage you to automate, but not completely mechanize. And the reason you don't want to completely mechanize is you still want to be able to use the brain that's sloshing around in your head. But if you can, for instance, let's say you're looking at a market and you're looking to play a pullback and you want to enter at $12 a share. I just pulled the number out there. It doesn't matter, but whatever, $12 a share. And the market's at $11.75 or $11.50 or whatever. And you might have some other business to take care of or you might even have to just go to the bathroom or something. Well, provided that the market is already open and trading, you could put in a buy stop order at that level and then go about your life. And when you receive an alert that you got triggered in to the trade, then you could possibly put in a stop order to take you out. And in some cases, maybe even a limit order to take you out of half of the shares. And then try, I know it's hard, but try not to watch that screen too much. So I would encourage you to automate where possible, but not completely mechanize, just in case some discretion is necessary, your trading. And this is especially true for day trades when as a longer term trend follower, as a swing to intermediate term trend follower. So I'm coming from the viewpoint of, OK, I'm a longer term trader. OK, I, I do swing trade, but I'm trying to capture that longer term trend as part of that swing trade or have that swing trade turn into a longer term trade. So. I have no business day trading, but if I see kind of like Jimmy Rogers says that money lying in the corner, I'm here anyway, I might as well walk over there and pick it up. And I know it's, it's often not that easy, but you get the idea. I have to have like a can't stand it test. If I can't stand it, it's such a great little day trade opportunity in one of these overs, then I'm going to go ahead and take it. I would encourage you to make fewer observations. This is especially true. If you take a little day trade, as long as you have your orders in place, which we'll talk about in one second, then you might be better off letting things unfold. Ed Sakota once said that having a quote machine on your desk is like having a slot machine on your desk. You're going to want to feed it. And that's that's been true. And that's one of my demons, so to speak. If I watch a screen too much, I'm going to start trading. Now, one of the reasons that you want to make fewer observations, and this, this can go a lot deeper than today's conversation, obviously, but we can kind of scratch the surface a little bit. Keep in mind that due to the fact that the market's back and fill a lot, most of the observations you make will be negative ones. And I'll give you a case in point for the overall market, Greg Morris, when talking about the overall market, the overall market, believe it or not, only makes new highs 4% of the time. And that's a pretty amazing statistic. If you stand that on its head or flip it around, I should say, that means that 96% of the time the market is back and then filling, the overall market that is. Now, I like to think that if you get your market timing right in an inefficient issue that you approve upon those odds, but just know in the back of your mind that overall, the market is only making new highs 4% of the time. So the point I'm trying to get to, believe it or not, I have one, is that most of your observations will be negative ones. And here's where the neurology comes in. A negative emotion has two times the impact as a positive one. So let's say you're giving up some of those open profits. Well, that's going to make you feel twice as bad as you felt good when you were excited to see those profits to begin with. I'll give you another example, which I talked about in the aforementioned webinar. Some days I'll come in and I'll have four out of five positions working. Doesn't always work that way, that good. I wish it did. You'd never see my fat ass again. But anyway, I digress. 
but I'll have four out of five positions working and one will be going against me and not in like a huge way, but just kind of like in a normal sort of way, hasn't really stopped me out quite yet. It's going against me. And that one position will tend to influence my mood. And then sometimes at the end of the day, I'm like, well, wait a minute, I actually made money today, but I was bummed out because I let that one position get to me. And even on, on those four other positive positions, again, probably most of the day they were going against me to begin with. And if I'm watching those, or more often than not, they're going against me than going higher. If I'm watching those, then I'm going to be more and more stressed out. An example I gave a while back along this line of reasoning was I was in a stock and I was up 20%, like by 10 o'clock or whatever. I'm in central time. And then I kept watching it and watching it. And then I looked away for a minute, looked back, and then it was only up 11%. Well, I was actually, I don't want to use the word depressed, but I was emotional that now I'm only up 11%. I started feeling like I was down 9%. And you can see how that, that downward spiral could happen really, really quickly. Whereas at the end of the day, if I had just looked at it and said, oh, wow, I made 11% on that trade. It's like, oh, yeah, it was a little higher during the day, but so what? 11%, that's better than poker the eye, right? So make fewer observations. And because of this negative emotion thing, and you could do a little studying of the gambling, and I hate to equate trade and gambling, but there were a lot of similarities, or I should say a lot of the pitfalls and dangers, even though hopefully we have a bit of an edge, whereas a gambler, as a general statement, does not have an edge. But hopefully you don't get into the, what's known as like the gambler's ruin. And the gambler's ruin is because, let's say he makes $1,000 and then he loses $1,000. Well, losing that $1,000 has twice the negative impact on him. So he's got to chase that high to try to make not only make back that thousand, but another thousand on top of that. And because the odds are stacked against them, eventually they end up in a really negative downward spiral. So very dangerous type of thing that can happen. Now, along those lines, the Sun Tzu rears its ugly head. If you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Okay, well, I know myself, like I've been saying recently, we're building a new house, and part of that house, we're building a separate office for me, and I literally went there last night to make sure everything was done properly. I don't know why it's so hard, but it, it's, you know, every little thing in the house, it's, it's a lot of work and we're, we're contracting it out. We're not subcontracting. But anyway, long story endless, they finally got my soundproofing right. My soundproofing is not to keep out outside noises, which is going to be nice in case now I'm in the neighborhood. Some, you know, people like to weed eat every time I do a webinar. I used to be in the middle of the country and I can get away with pretty much anything. But now that I'm going to be in the city, it's going to be important, obviously, for to keep those noises out. But more importantly, or the reason I've, I've, I soundproofed is so knowing my emotional self, if I'm in there dropping F-bombs, I don't want, because we're going to have, a, it's going to be attached to the house, but still a separate entrance. I don't want people in the house to be listening to me in here screaming and hollering or in there screaming and hollering. Now I'm working to get better, but in the meantime, I think it's important that I soundproof the walls first. So anyway, that's Sun Tzu, Order War, as you probably know. So along those lines, especially for me when it comes to something like a day trade, an opening gap reversal trade, I know that if I don't watch myself, if I'm not careful, if I don't put some sort of commitment device in place, which I think is James Clear is where I got that from, but... A commitment device is something that keeps you from, from doing the wrong thing. So I like drinking beer. So a commitment device for me would be don't buy any beer or don't, you know, don't throw a, a keg of beer in a kegerator. Don't go brew with my buddies and, you know, just don't have it readily available. That's kind of a tiny commitment device. Turn off your screens is a commitment device in trading. As I've said before, one client of mine who had a brokerage account where 
it was like a wealth management type of account. He has unlimited trades, but he also had his online account. He closed down his online account and moved his money over to the wealth management because he would have to call in his trades and to quote him, he didn't want to look like a lunatic. So that immediately stopped 99% of his day trading or 100% of his day trading and probably 99% of all the other unnecessary trades except for the trades that just look like the best trades in the world. It also stopped him from micromanaging his trades once he got in because he didn't want to be in and out all day looking like, again, a lunatic. So long story endless, the point I was going to make here is that within reason, you can do some automation. So I was watching the SOXL, and this was a bounce type of trade. Again, not my bread and butter, not my favorite thing to do, but I'm here and the opportunity presents itself. So sometimes I'll step in and take a trade like this. Now, I remember watching that first bar. And I was anxious to jump in, and then it came back in, and I breathed a sigh of relief. That third bar came along. It began to rally. I began thinking, well, I should get in, I should get in, I should get in. Then it came back in. And then I said, you know what, Dave, what would Dave do? Or what would Dave tell you to do? Kind of along the lines of plumbers having the worst pipes. So I said, well, what if I just put in a buy stop order and go about, go about my life? My little phone dings about 30 minutes later. I'm busy working on some other project or doing something else. I was like, oh, okay, well, looks like I'm long the Soxel. So let me put in a limit order to sell half, and let me put in an automated trailing stop to sell half. And the reason I put in that automated trailing stop just for half is because I want, if I hit the initial profit target, then half my shares come off. And then if I hit that trailing stop, or if the market hits that trailing stop, I should say, then the other half of my trade comes off. Now, the only danger in this, which is not hands off, is let's say that I don't hit this initial profit target and get stopped out of half of this position. Then I have to make one additional decision to get out of the remaining shares. So that's the only thing that is not automated, but I would caution you into into doing, do as much automation as you think you need, but then go no further. So we've been having a lot of conversations about some of this automated uh, trading with the OCA uh, orders, OCO, and that's, that's fine if you want to do that kind of thing. But the ultimate goal, keep in mind, when we're playing these opening gap reversals is to capture that trend day, is to get in down here somewhere around this opening gap reversal and then have this thing rally and rally and rally and rally all day long. And then the short covering comes in and they get the heck squeezed out of them and then the market goes up forever. And then you just get this huge move intraday. Doesn't happen that often, but if you position yourself doing something like this, there's the potential that you are positioned for when it does. And instead of watching that stupid screen all day long, you let things unfold. So I know myself, I know if I'm watching that screen, I'm gonna be inclined to make trades that I shouldn't. I'm gonna be inclined to get emotional. I'm gonna be inclined to drop F-bombs. So hopefully I'll get better at that, and that soundproofing I put in at least for <laughs> between the house and my office was a total waste of money. But knowing myself, it probably isn't. Now getting back to that quote, one of the things that came out of that quote and it said, to succeed as a trader, you have to not care, or to make money trading, you have to not care. I've talked about being flippant before, and I always feel like I've never been able to get the point across exactly right. And I think that this quote's kind of helped me get there a little bit. Curtis Faith comes to mind when, when you think of Flip It. He was in an interview on YouTube. They had the little show. I was actually part of the little show for a while. I forget the name of it, but it'll, it escapes me at the moment. Anyway, the, the host, Lindsay something, was asking him, you made all the money and then you lost all the money. And he, his point was, well, if I didn't have that, I couldn't give a flip attitude to begin with, I never would have made the money to begin with. Now, that's not saying be completely wild and crazy, but if you could be non-caring in the execution of your plan and let the chips fall when they may, then I think you'll do 
quite well, but you almost have to not care. Or in fact, according to Larry Williams, you have to not care, okay? Another concept that I talk about that I haven't fully fleshed out is you have to be kind of antiseptic. And that's kind of hard for me to explain. That's, I guess, detached is probably a better way from that and maybe removed. One thing that I've done before, and I think I've picked this up from Mark Douglas. I like to give him credit if not, uh, because I've gotten so much out of Mark Douglas, but it's almost like you have to see it as sometimes watching a movie and you have to watch your phraseology. Like instead of dropping that F-bomb, maybe say, oh, that's interesting. And I know easier said than done, but Sometimes you do have to be a little bit removed. My absolute best trading occurs when I have, and it's always, I used to always be scared to say this, but I'll just say it flat out. It's like when I have this out of body experience where it's like my hand is moving the mouse and clicking on the browser or clicking on the order entry system or whatever the case may be. And I am just clicking those orders in. And when I get through, I ask myself, what have I done? I actually have to go back in and look and see what I did. And those tend to be the best trades. I'm automatically taking those profits when I need to, when I don't have orders in place, that is. Or I'm automatically putting that order in place that needs to be put in place. As somebody once said, they think I'm a lot more discretionary. I'm sorry, they think I'm a lot more mechanical than I let on because I'm basically executing a discretionary system in somewhat of a mechanical way. And I, on the flip side, I've told my mechanical friends the same thing. They're not as mechanical as they think they are because they're putting a little discretion into the mechanical systems. Now, I don't want to get too far removed from the point I'm trying to make is, but you do have to separate yourself from the trading best you can. And again, like Douglas said, you have to almost see it like watching a movie. If you watch a movie, you get kind of excited, you get sad, you cry, whatever. But the bottom line is, you know that the bad guy is not going to get you, you know. <laughs> so it's like you're able to separate yourself from that. So try to see it as watching a movie. Try, I learned this from my first future broker, many, many years, futures broker, years and years and years ago, 20 some years ago, especially when I had a big drawdown and kind of poured my heart out to him. And his point was, well, make it a game and play the game. And that's that helps tremendously. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to play this game where I'm going to see if I could put the orders in that I need, and I'm going to see if I could not check in until I have to take action or not check in until I get an alarm and so on and so forth. So sometimes that's one way to, to help. Trade at a size that's almost meaningless. I have some small accounts out there and I make some little trades in them here and there. And I could care less about what happens. I mean, I want it to work out, don't get me wrong. But it's like, okay, I'm going to get in this little trade here. I got to stop here and I'll just forget about it. And sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised. Sometimes I'm stopped out. Either way, I don't care. But that trading is probably as close to perfect trading as I ever do. Why? Well, because. I don't care, I'm detached, I'm antiseptic, I'm removed, and I could be, again, flippant in my actions. So if you are having any trouble in your trading, and we all do, let's face it, we all do at various times, then you might wanna get a little smaller until you reach a point where your execution is flawless. And as long as you're, you're process oriented, following the process, even if your, your outcome is not exactly desired, then pat yourself on, back, on the back for following the process. And if the outcome is not desired, then focus on better input, garbage in, garbage out, right? And then work to improve that. And without giving the complete, you know, 20 hour psychological, psychology lesson, but work to improve that. And of course, after every trade, do the post-mortem and deliberate practice comes in mind. You need to work hard at getting better. Don't just work hard to find the best setups. Work hard at getting better at finding the best setups. All right, still have a few people who are gold members who have not joined the Facebook group. Please join. We A lot of good stuff comes out of it. It's in the menu on the top of the members area. And this is just one example from 
last week. I just flipped through that. And again, like I said, each week, or like I say each week, I'm helping those who truly want to be helped. And there's a few of you guys out there that are sponges and girls, and it's been wonderful working with you. And uh, one of you showed me like, hey, look, Dave, I'm I'm clicking away at these courses, and uh, good for you. So we're able to track your progress, and that's the whole purpose of this learning management system. One of the complaints I've gotten is like it's that it's too massive. Well, it's supposed to be massive, and I'm going to continue to add to it. And this is a lifelong learning thing. I don't want you to join and then quit a month later because you learned everything because there's so much to learn. There's really you you're never going to get you're never going to learn everything when it comes to markets, and that's why I'm constantly adding content to this. And then on top of that, your questions and answers are really helping me flesh out a lot of things. So check out the members area. You can start for free. All right, any questions about all that pontification? So let's start with the P's and take a look at some of these Morningstar industry groups. Okay, first of all, S&P 500. And let's take a look at Spiders first. So Spiders... A bit of a shoulder shrug. It always amazes me. Market is just off at a race is the next day. Pfft, doesn't do anything. Now, when I see a market like this, big slide down, sharp little retrace in here, the first thing that I'm thinking is let's see if we get the mother of all opening gap reversals. So if you come in here and the market gaps open way up here, there's a chance that people might be looking to get off the hook who got caught in that slide, and that selling could come in on the open. There's a lot of fun and games that happen on the open, and if you're, some people call it amateur hour, but I disagree. I think that if you're prudent, and if you're flat coming into the day on something like an index, and you get that big opening gap, then there's a potential to be right and be right big. Now, Notice you have like a trend day here, starts towards the bottom and ends at the top. Unfortunately, that wasn't down here at a new low, so it really didn't work out for an opening gap reversal. But that's the ultimate goal, is to catch those mother of all reversals from a severe oversold condition. Or, even better, when you have a setup like this, where this is setting up as another pullback in this slide, then look to play that opening gap reversal. So like I said, S&P 500, I wouldn't say we're out the woods just yet. We've had a big slide in here off a double top, okay? Not that I want to trade the double top in and of itself, but if I see a bow tie after the double top or some other kind of signals begin to trigger or a TFM 10% system triggering, then I know that the market could be in trouble. So I think now's the time to be prudent, pay attention. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. As you can see, pretty serious slide in place in the NASDAQ. Not quite as impressive of a rally. Bigger slide down, not quite as impressive of a rally. NASDAQ, I think, is a little bit more trouble than the S&P 500. Technology, which the NASDAQ represents, as you know, getting hit a little bit harder. I would still keep an eye out for a big opening gap reversal there. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Russell 2000 just can't seem to get out of its own way. Look at that. It's down a percent and change already today. Big slide down in here, a little bit of a retrace. Let's put it within context. Let's take a look at the weekly chart. Again, the big retrace rally we talked about. So far, we're still in that down leg here. So that's not looking too pretty. The semiconductors, we took a look at the SOSX a minute ago, and that was that opening gap reversal that was played on this day here, okay? So we could get another opening gap reversal here, kind of hanging in there, but so far a pretty serious slide. And so far, just pull it back a little bit in that slide. It would be fun, and I haven't done it yet, but it would be fun to go in and do some 10% TFM testing in these individual sectors and maybe figure out where you want to set that parameter. It might be a little bit higher than 10% in something like the semiconductors. Anyway, look at that. The semiconductors, as you can see, bow tie down after all time highs. That's never a good thing. The trigger was on this day here. Pretty serious slide, a little bit of retrace back up, but still looks like it's in lots and lots of trouble. Now, some excitement in gold within the metals and mining, but metals and mining overall, as you can see, not looking very pretty. Let's take a look at gold because somebody's going to ask for sure. Gold has been taking off in here. 
as I say ad nauseum, I'm more excited about gold when it's down at, let's take a look at like weekly chart, when it's up at these multi-year highs like this, coming off all-time highs or coming off of like 10-year lows like it is here. Not as excited when it's in a range like this, but if we start seeing some decent setups, then we might start taking them. The energies have been looking questionable at best as of late. As you can see, they've been in a pretty serious slide, bow tie down. Now this bow tie isn't off of all time high, so not as important, but it does give you a piece of information. And it does have that big picture retrace rally look to it. And so far, it appears to be in a new leg lower. A lot of areas just chopping around. A lot of these areas like the banks that never did make it back to brand new highs have begun to roll back over. So with, with the exception of like insurance and real estate, most areas are not looking too good in here. There's drugs, health services. Yeah, it's been improving as of late, but it's kind of all over the place. No trends there, no tradable trends at least. Manufacturing, bow tie down, first thrust. So as you go through these, you can see looking pretty, pretty ugly out there. How's that for an oxymoron from trend following more? Transport, same sort of action there too, as far as like the overall market, I should say. All time highs, bow tie down, bow tie trigger was here, a little slide, a little retrace. Looks like then a new leg lower. Now keep in mind that a few big up days would make all the difference in the world. Let's get back to the peas real quick. We're only 4% away from all time highs. So a 2% day and a 2% day, guess what? We're back to all time highs. We may have dodged a bullet in here. The point is be prudent, pay attention when the market begins to weaken. Let's take a look at bonds real quick and we'll take a look at the dollar too. Bonds are pretty amazing in here. Decent rally, that's probably one of the best trending markets as you can see. Looking really, really good. Let's take a look at the dollar. Bonds up, as you know, means rates down. And that's probably what's beginning to put a little pressure on the dollar. I am long the Aussie dollar and I am long the euro versus the dollar at this point. So essentially, I am short the dollar. Probably right, but early. Probably right big, but early. <laughs> that's the same thing, Michael. <laughs> Anyway, as you can see, dollar still looks like it's it could be in the early phase of being in trouble. Just for SMGs, let's take a look at the hourly chart in the dollar. I have not looked at this, at least not in the UUP. And I'd be willing to bet you a thousand bucks. Yes, you have a bow tie down in the hourly. Okay, this one didn't materialize, didn't actually trigger, but this one did. This is what's what I call sometimes a second mouse signal, and I've Picked that up over the years from somebody else. I'm not, I didn't invent that, but you'll notice that it's all over the internet. The early bird gets a worm, second mouse gets the cheese. Sometimes those second signals can be very powerful. But yes, the dollar has bow tied down on a weekly basis. Doesn't, I mean, uh, an hourly basis doesn't mean it's the mother of all tops, but it now begins to look like you might want to pay attention. Okay, uh, let's open it up for individual stocks. Okay, is AEP too efficient? Good question. I always love when somebody asks me a question about efficiency because that's somebody who's studied markets and understands these slightly more advanced concepts. So good question. So the question is, is AEP too efficient? I like the upper potential of ELP for utilities because of transitional pattern and made and is less efficient, but AEP is more textbook thoughts. Um, I would avoid something like AEP. When you look at it, it's like, wow, what a fantastic trend, but your HV is 16, which is pretty low, okay? And you would have to use, you'd have to put up a tremendous amount of capital in something like this. Now, I don't know how they derive their power. I'm guessing coal because that seems to be the most popular way. But God forbid, let's say it was, it was nuclear and something bad happened. You've got all this money tied up on margin on something like this and you get absolutely creamed. So the 
the juice isn't worth the squeeze in something like this. So to answer your question, yes, you answered your own question. I think something like this is a little too efficient. And, you know, barring a nuclear disaster, let's say that we find out the company was cooking its books or they miss a debt payment or they miss earnings or whatever, and this thing gets whacked overnight. You've seen me do presentations before where I show that a more volatile stock, because you end up trading more shares to compensate for the volatility, in other words, it's the devil you know, you actually end up doing, or having, I should say, less risk than trading a less volatile stock, putting a lot of money on the line. All right, long-winded answer is saying, <laughs> what about ELP? All right, so ELP is going to be more, yeah, see, that would be a better, if you want to rush out and trade utility, this is a foreign stock. I've been watching this one for a while. It's a little choppy, but that sort of comes with the territory because it's a foreign stock. But, yeah, I think you'd be much better off being in something like this and knowing the nature of the beast. So, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely, absolutely. WM. Now, WM is going to be a big, thick company. Actually, it's not as thick as I thought it would be. So, yeah, that looks pretty good, Zach. The only problem with this is let's take a look at this HV right here. It's 14. Now, if you don't have, I don't know what software you're using. If you don't have HV programmed, if you have Telechart, I'll give it to you. But if you, and I think I might have it for Metastock, which I got it off the internet for Metastock, so you can find it there. But anyway, uh, when I see an HV of 14, when I see a hundred and something dollar stock, I'm like, well, wait a minute. And then I also see a stock at these multi-year highs like this, a few little light bulbs, not light bulbs, alarms go off. Like, is this thing priced for perfection? This is a fairly thick stock. Let's add two zeros to that. It's like 50 million shares. I'm going to have to upgrade to the regular meta stock at some point. But it's a big company, and it's owned by a lot of people, and it's very efficient. So that means there's a, a, an S ton of analysts, meaning a lot of analysts. I don't want YouTube to demonetize my video. It might be too late. I may have cursed already. So there's a bunch of analysts analyzing the stock, and it's kind of under a microscope. So not that I would ever trade on fundamentals, but if they miss on earnings or something, it could really get hurt bad. And, and these big thick stocks do, or are, I should say, held hostage a lot more to the fundamentals. And they're under a microscope. So yeah, long-winded way of saying I would pass on that one, just uh, too efficient. And by the way, there's not a whole lot to look at right now. If you've been on the trading service, people come in the trading service and they see me go like a week or two without recommending one stock. And they're like, why the hell am I why the hell am I paying this guy? But they don't realize that, man, you know how much money I just saved you by, by not chasing your own tail, going after all these mediocre setups? And, you know, scratch your own itch. That's kind of what I do with trading service. Like, I'm I'm like the guy I wish I had 20-something years ago telling me to don't do anything, you know, instead of wasting your money in the market. Okay, NRG looks in trouble with utilities are trending the opposite way. Stay away, NRG. Um... Yeah, and the other thing, too, is if you're going to short something, that's still pretty high levels. No, I think that's possible. I think that's plausible. You know, I would much rather short a big, thick company like this than go after, like, a semiconductor where you can get into a lot of trouble, although I am beginning to see some shorts in the semiconductors. But, yeah, I think that looks okay. Uh, since it's in a little bit of a longer-term downtrend, I prefer a deeper pullback. But if you back the chart way, 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 way out, it still has a long ways to go. So long or short, short setup, yes. That looks pretty good. But still try to find something coming off of all-time highs, if possible. What are utilities doing? Yeah, utilities are headed higher. Now, you bring up an interesting point. He said that, hey, I like this potential short, but utilities are headed the opposite way. Well, your best transitional patterns are going to occur when the sector is actually headed the other way. Now, that's kind of the just the opposite of what I normally preach, because normally you want the sector headed higher, the stocks headed higher, the stock headed higher, stocks within the sector head, headed higher, and the market headed higher. However, when you begin to get a trend transition, what will start happening is individual issues within the sector 
will begin to break down. And then if the overall sector breaks down with it, then you've got a ton of wind in your sails or you, you've got everything behind you. So a little bit more dangerous to go in fighting that sector trend with a transitional pattern, but that's sometimes could be some of your best opportunities. So look at transitions a little bit differently or more differently than the other one. We talked a lot about Uber, and if you're following the five-day SMA thing that I wrote about in my column, then you would have had an entry, or I should say a trigger, yesterday on that. Let's double check that, because let's see what that high was. So the day one high was 45, and your close yesterday was 45. No, actually it would not have triggered yesterday. So your trigger would be, I like to give it a little bit of wiggle room, but in this particular case, even followed mechanically, it did not trigger. It has to close at a new closing high, okay? Or the close has to be above the all-time closing high. And if day one sets the high in this particular case, which it did, in other words, the high for day one's trading was on day one, then it also has to close above that high. So 45 would have to close above 45. Now it's a little tricky because it closed at 45. In a case like this, I would give it a little bit of wiggle room, maybe 45 and a half at least before getting in. Now with all that said, with something like an Uber, a big thick stock like this, especially since it's so much higher priced, remember with the buy at B, we're, the, one of the rules is that it has to be $20 or less, okay? Well, this isn't exactly buy at B. This is a little moving average system here, and there is no price limit. But when I see a stock up here, big, thick stock, up in its 40s as opposed to lower-priced IPO, instead of going after these pioneer signals, these early signals, I'm more inclined to wait for a secondary type of signal. In other words, something that's a little bit closer more close, I should say, or resembles more the core methodology, such as a pullback, or in some cases, let them just go bottom out, trade a bow tie or whatever. Okay, nearly out of time. Any more stocks? Any more questions? I know I went long today. I don't like healthcare sector right now, but CFMS looks good. Yeah, I mean, it's trending, obviously. Let's back to our way out. Um, you know, longer term, much, much longer term, one thing I'm seeing is it's getting ready to push into a big old gap. Now, that's probably not that big of a deal, but keep in mind that sometimes markets have long memories. Do you trade channels? No. No. I'm a trend guy. Channels would be more like reversions that mean type trading, I'm assuming, unless you're trading something like Darvis boxes where you're going with the trend. But no, don't don't trade that. Now, along the lines of like Darvish trading, if you're trading my style and you take the partial profits and you're trailing your stop, a lot of times that stock will keep building boxes on top of boxes while you're trading the trend. And that's a wonderful thing. That's it, Dave. I don't see anything else. Everything else is too efficient or just too choppy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you, Dathan. It's 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 just there's just not a whole lot out there. And the secret to trading, if there is a secret, is knowing when not to trade. And that's why you're seeing me talk more than I normally do about trading these little opening gap reversals and things, because that's all that's out there. That and then what have we been doing in the Facebook group? We've been talking about IPOs. And you guys have brought out a couple of cool ones, and I appreciate that. And I've mentioned one or two, I think, in the process. And we'll all be able to, we're not getting rich, but we're able to, make a little money here and there while we're waiting for setups. So absolutely, you, you nailed it on the head. Okay, I think I think that's it. I think that's all the time they give me. While we're in it, well, while we're done, I guess. <laughs> Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for coming. Any answer questions, daviddavelandry.com, or more. Or if you're in the members area, submit it through the Q&A system. That way we can make it more official. If the question does require a lot of thought and you're not a member, I will give you temporary access to the members area so you can go in to get your question answered. If it's something that's a little bit easier to cover or doesn't take as much time, I'll cover it 
in an upcoming week of charts. Anyway, I think that's it. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. We will talk, hopefully, we'll see you again, I should say, next Thursday. Thank you so much.